I'm so glad to see you're back. You're glad to see my friend, so I'm glad to see you're back. Hey, that's seriously. Welcome to the show. Little old me? Why, I'm that wise cracking quipster of the dark, Elvira. And we call the show Movie Macabre. Now, this time around, I'm serving up a little treat called Silent Night, Bloody Night. It's the tale of Yuletide Boar, er, uh, Gore. <laughs> Meant to say Gore. <laughs> a tale of Yuletide Gore that'll have you thinking twice about that home for the holidays baloney. It's Silent Night, Bloody Night. Another Movie Mac biggie coming your way right after the advertisers shake their tambourine. <laughs> One last time, I have to see this ground. It's beautiful now, as if nothing had happened here. Soon they will tear down the main house, and then nothing will be left. Nothing. Except what I remember. I grew up in the town nearby, where my father was the mayor, and where this house stood, waiting for me. It was built by Wilfred Butler. We had never seen him, and he never lived at home. Until the day before Christmas in 1950, he finally did come back for the last time. us believe that his death was an accident. No one knew that another person had come to Butler House that Christmas. Deputy Coroner of the County of Arlington, State of Massachusetts. I hereby find upon evidence of an autopsy conducted by the medical examiner of this county that the deceased, Wilford Butler, died as a result of burns inflicted accidentally upon himself on his own premises during the afternoon of December 24th, 1950. No further inquiry shall be held over the body of the deceased and this inquest is officially closed.
After the coroner's inquest, on New Year's Day, they buried Wilford Butler. There was no one there to mourn him. It was the funeral of a stranger. mind and body, at least what the world considers sound, do hereby leave my house and its grounds and all personal effects within that house to my only surviving relation, my grandson, Jeffrey Butler. And I solemnly charge him with one duty. Let him leave the house as I left it, standing untouched to remind the world of its inhumanity and cruelty. For 20 years, that house lay empty, exactly as Wilfred left it. And then, last year, rumors began that it was finally being sold. The newspaper story traveled through the county to a state hospital for the criminally insane. The man who came to sell the house had never seen it. He was a lawyer from the city, just doing a job and enjoying it. Thank <laughs> you. 
all in my Italian. It's beautiful. Can we see the rest of it? <laughs> Honey, that was it. I think the mayor's waiting for me. My love is such an important man. Right. Laura always says that. Darling. What? Don't be long. Honey, if you get bored, just look at the view. Sooner or later, that viaduct's gonna take us back home. Mr. Carter. Mr. Mayor. Let me introduce you. This is Charlie Toman, who publishes our weekly newspaper, The Patriot. Mr. Toman. Mm -hmm. And this is Tess Howard. How do you do? She operates our switchboard. Oh, really? We call her the communications director. And this is Bill Mason. Mason? Our sheriff. Won't you sit there, Mr. Carter? At the head of the table. Thank you. I, um, uh, I didn't expect to meet you all together. It's, it's quite a reception. Let's begin. As you know, I've been retained by Jeffrey Butler. The matter concerns the house that he inherited from his grandfather, Wilfred Butler. Go on, Mr. Carter. I, I believe that you offered to buy the house for my client. Offered? We begged him. We wrote letters That's and we... That's enough, Tess. Well, it's true. Trouble. There's always trouble. I can sympathize. I spent the last 20 years and more driving people away from there. Prowlers, burglars, kids, they're the worst. Chasing for nothing because of that will. That dribble about humanity. No, no, no. Inhumanity. What the hell is that, huh? Yes, well, he was a bitter man. Hate. It must have been very hard. It must have been hate. That man hated. Well, some people are like that. The question is, well, do you still want the house? Are you offering it to us, Mr. Carter? Exactly. Why now? Well, that's Mr. Butler's business, isn't it? You know we're not rich. Most of us came here during the Depression. But we love this town. It's our home. And naturally, you want to improve it. Exactly. 
My client understands that, and he fully sympathizes, and he's willing to sacrifice the house for $50,000 in cash by noon tomorrow. That's an awful lot of cash. It's also an awfully good bargain. You could go to Wilton. You could go now to the bank. Am I clearly understood? All that cash. Perfect. I'll wait for your answer till tomorrow. You're spending the night here? Yes. May I ask where? At the Butler House. We could put you up at the motel as our guest. No, no, the house is fine. The Paradise Motel. That's very kind of you, but I'm, I'm meeting Mr. Butler about some uh, personal items. You want a phone. I can reconnect the line. D don't trouble, please. No trouble. You need a phone. Don't want to be stuck out there. Well, you've uh, convinced me. Thank you. By the way, have you known Mr. Butler a long time? No, I've never met him. He called me and asked me if I'd handle this for him. I said yes. He had the key delivered to my office. Mr. Mayor, Sheriff, Mr. Tolman, Ms. Howard, see you all tomorrow. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Really slick. He's a big lawyer, Bill. You've got to expect that. Don't tell me about lawyers. Oh, you see the way he looked at us? You see his clothes? He's doing his job. Just don't tell me about lawyers. You know what I'd like to see? Two of them like that one talking to each other. Neither one of them would know what to believe. I love you, too. Honey, when I get home, I'm going to have a nice, nice surprise for you. No, no, I can't tell you what it is now. It wouldn't be a surprise, now, would it? No, no, I can't come home now, but it'll be very soon. Very soon. Co Honey, of course I miss you. Yes, yes, I, I miss Mommy, too. Uh, Laura, how are you, kid? Hello, Mr. Butler. Hello, Mr. Butler. So, I'll call tomorrow. Uh, no, I want to call. I want to talk to Jenny. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, I'm having a fine time. Well, same to you, darling. What do you mean, hostile? I was wondering, if we get it, what then? Tear it down. Okay. Okay. I'd better get going. Do me a favor, Tess. Call Diane, tell her I'm to Wilton, and I'll be back late. Yeah, he's going to Wilton, and so's this doggone movie. Wilton right before her eyes. Willard, what a bird. I think they named it after a rat or something. <laughs> something about a small town like that, especially around the holidays, it's like one big happy family. Everybody getting together to laugh and be merry, to sip a little eggnog out of the styrofoam cup, and to sing an old Yuletide favorite or two. Yeah, I always liked that one. Hey, what about Jingle Bells? Give us a little bit of that. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride.
It's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Butler wasn't kidding. Nobody's lived here for years. That would be such a waste. It's his grandfather's monument. You know, it's a caretaker who keeps this place just the way he left it. What kind of monument is this? <laughs> well, that's the trouble. Nobody remembers anymore. That's what usually happens in America. I remember this. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy he shares, I carry there. <laughs> You're not serious. You used to hear that at funerals. At funerals? Yes. I was a kid in Chippewa, Georgia. There's also a Chipley flower, though. But they have both been subsequently eradicated from the map. was a delicatessen, so I brought you pastrami, salami, potato salad, macaroni, everything you like. I'll have bologna and macaroni. No, 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 some of that potato salad. Did you pick the wine, too? The delicatessen man took a personal interest in its selection. Oh, well, we got lucky again. That's early 1970. That's hard to come by. Can I have some, too? Of course, of course you may. Mm, thank you. who lived here. They must have had a wonderful life. Well, I hope they did. Wilfred Butler must have believed in something. Believe. Look at that stone fireplace. Parquet floor. The mahogany. This table. Now, you probably think this place is made of wood, right? Well... Wrong. You know what his grandson told me? Underneath that wood, there's two feet of stone. The foundation is eight bricks wide. Now, someday they're going to come in here and they're going to tear this place down and they're going to build little tract houses all over this property on quarter acre and half acre lots. And that bulldozer is going to come up that hill toward this house. And it's going to get the surprise of its life. They built a kingdom out here. Only nobody's left. No? Butler has a grandson. Well, he's probably like the rest of us, wants money. You know, he's asking $50,000 cash for this place, and if he only really can get, or oh, he can get at least 250000 But he won't take his time. So he'll get screwed. Do you want to go upstairs now? Soon. You know, one of the great pleasures in life it's the pleasure of anticipating pleasure, isn't it? We are very close now, aren't we? Sure, honey. Very close. I don't see any beds yet. Well, keep looking, honey. Butler said the place is furnished. It's furnished.
Anything doing? No, sir. But look at this. More football, huh? Look how they smeared that quarterback. Look at his arm. Got no time now. Otas. How about that telephone up at the Butler house? Is it working? Well, try it now. I'll wait. Hello? Oh, yes, Miss Howard. Yeah, the phone's working fine. Uh, very nice of you to call. Thank you. Good night. Honey, I'm going down to the car to get some cigarettes. Be back in a minute. Okay. Don't get lonely. No, no. your cigarettes? Yes. Yes, I did. May I have one? Sure. Well, it's the most amazing thing. These cigarettes come in these very small packages these days. Oh, that's for me? Mm -hmm. Can I open it? Oh, no, no, no. Our Christmas is day after tomorrow. Is that an order? Yes, ma'am, that's an order. Like the mayor wanted him to. Yeah, you can say that again. 
Boy, I wonder if he moonlights as a desk clerk down there at the Paradise. Can you imagine spending the night in a joint called the Paradise Motel? Maybe a couple of hours, but not the whole night. I know all about those places. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, read the backs of a lot of maps books. You know, uh, uh, there's mirrors and waterbeds and those movies on the TV. <laughs> a regular Sodom and Cremora. <laughs> Not the kind of place I'd want to be pop sneaking out of at three in the morning. <laughs> so far, I've been lucky. Meanwhile, it looks like that lawyer and his girlfriend have run plum out of luck. Double lousy for her because she never even got to open a Christmas gift. <laughs> well, it's probably just another bottle of that cheap perfume anyway. Well, back to the movie after this time out. <laughs> Uh, Bill, someone's calling from Butler House. Okay, put them on. Go ahead now. Mr. Carter? I'm not Carter. Who is this? The honor. Butler. I'm worried, Cherish. Carter's not here. Speak up, I can't hear you. What is it? What's wrong? His car is here, but he's gone. Won't you come? Okay, okay. Now you stay put in that house. I'll wait for you. Please, hurry. I, I'm afraid. Now take it easy. I'm coming. <sighs> Mr. Butler, are you done? this. You know me, Tess. It's Mary Ann. Tell the mayor. Tell them all. I'm waiting in my father's house. Tess, it's so lonesome here. Don't be long. Hello? 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 Thank goodness. What is it, Tess? Something's come up. Something urgent. Can you start early? Oh, honey, I'm watching TV. Maggie Daly, you get yourself over here. What is it? Just get moving, Maggie. Just please hurry.
Come in. It's open. Okay, mister, that's far enough. What do you want here? Mayor. Try again. My father's not home. And don't move. You want me to put my hands up? No. Just stay there. What are you staring at? I seem to remember you from the road. That's why I'm holding a gun. You scare me. Well, that makes sense. Thanks. Does everybody carry one here? You can ask the sheriff when he gets here. I'll call him. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the, uh, the sheriff's office is empty. How do you know? I was just there. Who are you? A Jeffrey Butler. Oh, you're the one who's selling the house? Yes. Have you any ID? Come on. Don't laugh at me. I want your ID. Some maniac escaped from Margaretville. Okay. Put it on the table. Now go back. California license. Lucky you. Would you like to see my maniac card from the asylum? Will they give you one when you escape? It has a big scarlet M on it so people won't get confused. Okay. Look, I'm sorry about the gun. My father's in Wilton getting your money. All I want to do is to get into my house. The sheriff's deputy might have a key. He's about the only one I know of. Well, where's he? You go down the road about a mile and a half till you come to a white house with a white fence, and then you can't miss it. Thanks. That's okay. Merry Christmas. Same to you. If I don't call back in an hour, what? Call the mayor or Mr. Tolman and nobody else. Promise me you'll do that. Well, sure. Mark it down, honey. So you'll have it. Hey, looks like Tess is kind of hot for tango. <laughs> When she gets herself a live one, she doesn't waste any time. That kind of sounded like my old pal Breather on the line, didn't it? <sighs> Mr. Butler, are you done? Yes. I've come back. What's that? Yes. I want to see you again. Hello? Who is this? Breather called the other day to whisper sweet everything's in my ear. What a guy. If you ever see him in a police lineup, you'll recognize him by the black and blue marks all over his body. Yeah, that's from people touching him with a ten-foot pole. Meanwhile, it looks like all you really need to score in East Willard is a California driver's license. California license? Lucky you. Yeah, lucky you. I flunked that test four times. That license in about 30 bucks should be good for a room down at Paradise Motel. Well... There's more ghoul-tied merriment when Silent Night, Bloody Night continues. West on Route 5 to Butler House. You'll hear from me. What the hell? That light out there.
Hi. Hi. Did you find the deputy? No, I wasn't there. Oh. I was thinking, isn't your lawyer supposed to be at the house? The door was locked. His car was there, so I borrowed it. You mean you stole a car? Yeah. I'm keeping it warm. What if he needs it? Let him find me. Who's coming to dinner? Oh, Daddy. We always have dinner every Thursday. Do you want something? No, I ate uh, Paradise once, huh? Yeah, I know. It's awful. What about a drink? Yeah. It's uh, cheap bourbon, but that's a big favorite around here. Do you want ice? No, straight. You look tired. I am tired. Well, here's to a fast dollar. Cheers. Why did you decide to sell the house? Needed the cash. After all these years? I need it now. What's it like on the inside? You know, I've never seen the inside. When I was a child, my father told me to stay away from it or something terrible might happen. Sort of like a haunted house. I haven't seen it either. You're going to sell it and you've never seen it? Yeah. I don't know. It's too bad. It's about the only place to see around here. Oh, I forgot. Someone keeps calling with a message for my father. She says that she's waiting at your house, in the reception room. What woman is waiting in my house in the reception room? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's not a voice that I know. I better go out there. Can I come too? What for? I'm pushy. I suppose you'll be going back to California soon. You said you lived there, remember? No, I'll be traveling. Jeff, look. It's the sheriff's car. That tombstone. Pretty cheerful. Who bears the cross shall wear the crown. Wilfred Butler. My grandfather. Oh. <gasps> Someone left their sunglasses in the snow. They're the sheriffs. My lawyer's missing. So is the sheriff. You get strange phone calls. And now someone's fascinated by my grandfather's grave. Let's get out of here. You still want to go to my house? Yes. Uh, but I don't want to go alone. Listen. I'm not nervous. Well, of course you're not. Oh, it's the cold. I'm shaking from it. Let's get out of here. We'll get help in town. It's 10 minutes drive. Good night, Mr. Tillman. 
Have a nice holiday. Deputy's not here, but Toman is. Who's Toman? Come on, you'll see. <laughs> Mr. Toman, wait. No, please, I have to talk to you. I'm sorry, this is Jeffrey Butler. He's the one who's selling the house. He can't get inside the place. And my father's gone to Wilton. So we wondered... Mm -hmm. Anything wrong? He'll tell us. Tess... has gone to his house. Why would she go there? I don't know. Anyway, she won't get in. You say it's locked. He says she hates the place. Would you like to drive there? Diana could stay here, lock herself in. I need a key. a little too willing to put her trust in that Jeffrey Butler fella. I mean, I don't know about their rest here, but he gives this mistress of the dark the crepes. I mean, just take the way he smashed in the window of his car. Now, I have locked myself out a few times in my life, okay? But I've always used the old coat hanger trick, not a tire iron. Well, I guess if you're a girl living in East Willard, you can't afford to be too picky. <laughs> take whoever comes along, even if he might be a maniac. Right now, she's saying to herself, well, what the heck, he may not be the best-looking guy in the world, and he ain't no snappy dresser, but he does have a California driver's license. Okay, more hot times at the butler house are coming up, so stay glued. <laughs> we'll be right back. Tess isn't here. Are you satisfied? She must have gone to my place. 
Why wouldn't she go there? She hates it. Maybe she went to see the woman who's there. Someone called the mayor's house before. Said she'd be waiting. What is it? Is anybody there? Who is this? I'm Diane Adams. I spoke to you before. Bring your father to the house. This is Marianne. Tell him I have the diary. I'm waiting. Who are you? Sheriff, I saw your car. Bill, is that you? Oh. <sighs> 
1920. The person on the telephone said 1935, Christmas Eve. But that's not the beginning. In 1927, Butler House was restored by Wilfred Butler. After that, I find social notes, parties, nothing special. Then, in 1930, Butler's wife, Catherine, dies of tuberculosis. In August 1933, it starts. Wilfred Butler's daughter is cruelly attacked and raped. Her name is Mary Ann, the same name as the caller who left those messages tonight. She's 15 then. On May 2nd, 1934, Mary Ann Butler gives birth to a son, Jeffrey Butler. Jeff. Early in 1935, Butler House is turned over to a Dr. Robinson as an asylum for mental patients. And then Butler goes on to say that he has committed his own daughter. Mary Ann will live at the asylum. There's no end to this story. It's been carefully cut out of all the papers. Why would Toman do that? <laughs> has 40 bird cages. Toman is hysterical. Everybody's in my house but me. It's cold outside and you forgot to lock the door. Jeff, how old are you? How old am I? You mean how many years have I lived? Yeah, same thing. No, there's a lot in the paper about your family. I don't want to talk about my family. Wait a minute. There's a woman calling and she says her name is Mary Ann. That was your mother's name, wasn't it? My mother died in childbirth. That's when I started traveling. It's not what the papers say. What's your point? I just thought that you should read something for your own good. Nothing you could tell me about my past or future would be for my own good. Where is the paper? It's on the table. It's so stupid to lie. I missed the whole event. Jeff? Maybe your mother's still alive. Maybe she's waiting for you at the house. I don't know. Come on. No more side trips. Let's go out there. Oh, you know, time to take our instant poll. Time to find out what you, the viewers, think of this week's movie. You, sir, what do you think of Silent Night, Bloody Night? I don't know. Well, that's fair enough and honest answer. You, miss, how do you feel about the movie? There's no end to this story. <laughs> well, I admit it's a little slow in places. Oh, I wonder how she talks without moving her lips. Cool. Uh, oh, you over there on the phone. Are you enjoying this movie? 
Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, I'm having a fine time. One yes, one no, and one I don't know. Uh, you, sir, you look like you might have an opinion. What do you think of Silent Night, Bloody Night? <laughs> Cut off his hands. You killed him. You killed Tolman. He's asking for help. You killed him.
Yes, what? This is Marianne Butler. I'm calling from my house. Won't you come over here, Mr. Mayor? We're having a reunion. Everyone's here, even your daughter. Write this knowing that no one shall ever see it. Not my beloved daughter, or even my grandson, Jeffrey. I write for myself in the hope of forgiveness, if that is still possible. And I write for you, Marianne, whose youth and innocence I have destroyed. By 1935, the doctors had treated my daughter for a year. I had believed they could cure her. The child, Jeffrey, was taken from us and sent to California. <laughs> I turned my house into an asylum. I brought doctors to live there. I welcomed other patients. Useless. All of it. I remembered what she had been there was never a lovelier, happier child. of the first year, I knew that I must act, not for myself, but for my helpless child. Led him to create this institution. Our friend... I had no plan. All I knew was that I must take her from these men with their promises, their lies. Shall we? For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny, which nobody can deny, which nobody can deny, for he's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny. Now, if you're wondering why all of a sudden they went to that cheap black and white film, it's on account of they ran into a little money trouble. Well, that's what they get for squandering their budget on the earlier scenes. Remember that takeout food from the deli? You think they give that stuff away? And what about smashing that windshield? I mean, you think those things are cheap to replace? Heck no. And what about all the times they forgot to turn off the red light on the sheriff's car when the engine wasn't running? Huh. Forget it, Die Hard. You're gonna ran that battery down just like Jeffrey Butler ran down John Carradine. New battery's gonna set you back a good 50 buckaroos. All that cash. 
Well, no. You might want to charge it. Charge it, yes. <laughs> I knew that they would gorge themselves into a stupor that afternoon. It was their celebration. I expected no less. Since they had come into my house, they had acted as if they owned it. They had behaved like poor relations, half guilty, but finally unable to control their appetites. saw a light. There is a light at the end of a long tunnel. There is a light at the end of a long tunnel. Stay here, doctor. I'll get more champagne. He was ready. I knew it. Drunk and fat and full of his own importance. I left then. My cruelty to Marianne was inhuman. I know that. I had loved her. I had fathered our child, Jeffrey. I had brought her to this. But I swear that on that afternoon, all I wanted was to save my child. was to get her away from that house. But also, I wanted to set free those other wretches who had so long been abused by the doctors. Inmates were freed. And this 
is my guilt. I knew, and still, I freed them. started for the house. I went to get our car to take Marianne away. I do not know exactly when she slipped away from me. I assume that when they saw her in the dining room, 
the inmates believed her to be part of that household which they hated. And so, they killed her. Later, there was a celebration. And then most of the inmates fled, I don't know where. I shall never forget what they did to my child. Since that Christmas, I have lived in prisons and asylums, lived anonymously as an animal. I have wandered in bitterness until all seasons have become as one, and that is a season of vengeance. A cheery little flashback. Ugh. That butler house looked like it was a fun joint back in the old days. But those darn party crashers will ruin a good time every time. Hey, it looks like they were able to come up with another roll of color film. <laughs> Must have passed the hat or something. Boy, am I glad about that. Because that black and white stuff was giving me a real headache. And I ain't just saying that to get out of doing something, you know what I mean? I am talking major migraine. Okay, after the commercials, we'll be back to finish off this little yarn. That's right, the exciting climax is next, so stick around. Jeff. Wilfred Butler is still alive. This is still his house. Your grandfather died in 1950. He was burned to death in this house. My grandfather poured gasoline over a squad we found here. The town wanted to believe he was dead. They still do. This house was an asylum. There was a massacre by the inmates. Tess, Toman, the sheriff. Your father. No. All inmates. They killed my mother in this room. Yeah. <laughs> 
I spent that night weeping. By morning, there were no more tears. I know that my father and Jeffrey both thought they were shooting at killers, but they were simply the last victims in that house of victims. And now, a year later, they will tear down Wilfred Butler's monument. But they can never destroy my memories of what happened here. Canon release. The producers threw in the towel. The towel. Canon towel. Get it? <laughs> oh, little Canon towel humor there. But seriously, I didn't mind when they ran out of color film, and I didn't mind when they ran out of plot. But I did mind when they ran out. I mean, here I am with egg on my nog, trying to figure out who did what to whom. Well, the best I can figure it is. Jeffrey Butler's grandfather was really his father, which would make his mother his sister. We don't even want to talk about Uncle Charlie because he was probably his aunt. Uh, anyway, Wilfred Butler, Mary Ann Butler, Jeffrey Butler, take your pick. Anyway, you slice it, the butler did it. And that's it for this week's Movie Macabre. Next time around, I'll be plucking from our vault yet another tale of the bizarre. So I hope to see you then, and until then, then, keep on a-dreaming those unpleasant dreams. Thank <laughs> you.